Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Almighty God, to all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. God, whose glory is always to have mercy. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. A reading from the book of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram. Your name shall be Abraham. And for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you. And kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Book of Romans. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are in, who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that did not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus began to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. Why does Jesus keep talking about the necessity of his suffering and death? These are certainly odd things to stress. Unless, of course, one is a masochist. No wonder Peter is so disturbed by this morbid foreboding. I can imagine Peter taking Jesus aside and asking, what are you talking about, Jesus? You're supposed to be God's anointed one. We're counting on you to be the Messiah who will lead Israel to freedom and glory. So how can you do that if you are rejected? and put to death. And then Jesus, with a flash of vehemence that he shows only rarely, turns to Peter and delivers the strongest of rebukes. Get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Those last words of Jesus' rebuke are of key importance. You see, the clash between Peter and Jesus is about dramatically different expectations. Peter, along with many of his Jewish contemporaries, expects the Messiah 
to be a hero who will wondrously overthrow Israel's Roman conquerors, restore Israel's sovereignty, and usher in a new era of prosperity. Jesus, however, has come to a very different conclusion about the kind of Messiah that God has called him to be. The kind of Messiah that God, not human beings, has in mind is not the conquering hero, but the suffering servant. When Jesus rebukes Peter with those stern words, get behind me, Satan, it's because Peter's attempt to dissuade Jesus from the way of the cross reminds Jesus of his struggle with Satan over this very issue. In the wilderness experience that followed Jesus' baptism, Satan, the great tempter, tried to convince Jesus to take the easy and the expected path of messiahship. First, there was Satan's suggestion that Jesus be a wonder-working Messiah who would do tricks like turning stones into bread. Jesus rejected that temptation, saying, We shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus would be a Messiah who would fill our hunger for God not just our hunger for food. And Satan then offered to make Jesus the ruler of all the kingdoms of this world. Just think what good you might do, Jesus, with all of that power. And When Jesus rejected the offer, he was saying no to being a political leader who could force us to obey him. Instead, Jesus would seek to bring about changes in the world by changing people's hearts. Finally, Satan presented Jesus with the choice of being a Messiah who would be exempt from pain and suffering. Surely God's Holy One would have a right to such protection. Angels will hold Jesus in their hands, lest he dash his foot against a stone. When Jesus rejected that offer, Jesus was choosing to take up the cross and enter fully into all the pain and suffering human beings have ever known. So then when Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected and killed. Jesus was not just predicting his future. He was announcing his mission, what he must do. When Jesus stretched out his arms to be nailed to the cross, God would reveal the full breadth and depth of God's love. Many centuries ago on the island of Formosa, there lived a Chinese governor named Goho. Now Goho was a man of humane and liberal outlook for his time and was respected and loved by all the people. One of Goho's first acts as governor was to induce the tribes under him to abandon the ancient custom of offering a human sacrifice each year to ensure a good harvest. Goho persuaded the farmers to be content with the sacrifice of an ox or a pig. For 40 years, this new arrangement worked out well. The animals were killed, the crops flourished. But then there came several years of drought and disastrous harvests. There wasn't enough to eat. 
people began to be frightened. Their leaders came to Goho and said that the animal sacrifices would no longer do. The gods were angry. They must have a human sacrifice once again, or there would be no rain. Goho argued with them, and he pleaded with them, but in vain. The gods must be satisfied, insisted the people. So finally, seeing that he could no longer prevail against the people's wishes, Goho yielded. Tomorrow at dawn, he said, go to the place of sacrifice in the forest, and there you will find the victim ready, a man tied to a tree, wearing the red robe of sacrifice and a red cloth tied over his face and head. Strike, for he is your victim. The next morning, the people gathered at the appointed place, and there they saw the victim dressed in red, his face covered with a red cloth. One of the leaders stepped forward and with a sharpened sword struck off the victim's head. And when the red cloth fell away, the face of the man was revealed. It was Goho himself. The people were appalled by what they had done. And from that day on, no human sacrifice was ever offered in Formosa again. By the sacrifice of his own life, Goho did what by his rule and teachings he had so far failed to do. He changed people's hearts and minds, and he changed them permanently. Sometimes it takes a tragic death to bring people to their senses and bring about a change of heart or a change in point of view. Fifty years ago, the shooting of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., as he stood on the balcony of a motel in Memphis, Tennessee, shocked our nation into a new sensitivity to the evil of racism. The tragedy gave us a renewed commitment to end racial segregation and reinvigorated the American civil rights movement. In May of 1970, members of the Ohio National Guard fired upon unarmed students at Kent State University. Students who were protesting against the American war in Vietnam. Four of the students were killed. Nine others were wounded, one of whom suffered permanent paralysis. The Kent State shootings produced a powerful national response. Hundreds of universities, colleges, and high schools were closed, with a strike of four million students. And public opinion across the nation shifted significantly against U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Likewise, two weeks ago, the mass shooting of students at a high school in Parkland, Florida, started a movement that might bring about change in our country's gun laws. Never again, and enough is enough, have been the rallying cries of angry students in Florida and around the country since the deadly shooting. The loss of innocent young people at the hands of a deranged teenage assassin may well prove 
the tipping point that moves the national conversation about gun control out of stalemate into effective action. The outrage of America's youth will then be vindicated. And the deaths in Parkland High School will not have been in vain. When Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem and the death that awaited him there, he did so with the awareness that it was this that was necessary to change us. Jesus knew that his teaching alone did not have the power to turn human beings from the error of our ways and our, open our hearts to God's love and mercy. All the sermons on the mount that he could ever preach could not accomplish this. It would take Jesus' death on the cross, a death that Jesus embraced willingly to show us the extravagance of God's love. Only the cross would have the power to break down the walls of race, class, and clan, of fear, hatred, and resentment that divide the human race and make us one united people. Only the cross would have the power to make us turn away from selfishness and fear and dedicate ourselves to the God who loves us so dearly. Some look on the cross and see nothing but the spiritual bankruptcy of the human race. Jesus is just another innocent victim of humanity's cruelty and blindness. Such a view will lead us to frustration, sadness, and cynicism. What's the use of sticking your neck out? What's the use of trying to make the world a better place? You'll only end up on a cross like Jesus. Some look on the cross and see Jesus dying there to satisfy the requirements of an angry God. Jesus had to die to pay the price of our sins. Now such a view certainly stresses a God of justice, but by itself does not give us an adequate picture of a God of love. And what's more, people who focus on God's justice often get pretty judgmental themselves. So here's a local example. During the debate on capital punishment in Connecticut a few years ago, there were Christians who argued that the death penalty is indeed a holy and righteous thing. And why? Because if God imposed the death penalty on his own son, why should we have mercy? Others look on the cross and see Jesus dying there to reveal once and for all the mercy of God. God so loves the world and everyone in it that in Jesus, God gave God's very life for us. Catch but a glimpse of that view of the cross and your heart will turn to God. And isn't that what God really desires? Isn't that the only thing that will change the world?
Please stand as we affirm our faith by reciting the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternal begotten of the Father, God of God, life of life, true God and true God, the God not made, one being with the Father, and with him all things were made. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray for the church and for all of God's creation, for our bishops, Ian and Laura, our ministers, and for all of God's people, that we may serve you with humility, compassion, and love. Lord. We pray for those of us who are grieving. May we know God's healing touch and mend our broken hearts. We hold in our hearts the victims of the shooting in Parkland, Florida, their family and friends, and all victims of violence. We pray for all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and for all the departed. Lord. We hold up in prayer all those who are suffering, sick or infirm. May they be comforted by your healing touch and loving care. We offer prayers for those on our prayer list, either silently or aloud. Lord, have mercy. We pray to the people of fierce and tender love, caring for each other, building strong communities, and welcoming each other. Give us vision to see what needs to be seen. Give us courage to do what needs to be done. And in all that we do, guide our steps so that we may find ourselves following the path that Jesus set. We pray for the needs of our most vulnerable neighbors, O Holy One. We lift up refugees and immigrants the world over, in Syria and surrounding nations, in Northern Africa, in Europe, and here in the United States. May they know your accompanying presence, sustain the support they so desperately need, and make possible the new beginnings for which they yearn. We pray for our nation and its leaders. Give them a vision of the kind of world you envision. Guide lawmakers to make laws that are just. Guide leaders throughout the world. When hard decisions are at hand and people's lives are at stake, to be compassionate, wise, and just. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, Father, for it by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And we are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may be light in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning, please be seated. Welcome all to St. John's in this soggy morning. If you're new or if you haven't been here in a while, please feel free to fill out the pew card hanging in the pew in front of you and put in the offering plate, and I would be delighted to be in touch with you to learn more about you and to share more about the story of St. John's. We do have a very special guest here. I would like to say thank you to Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman. She was our first uh, interviewee for our session of Faith at Work, kicking off our four-part series. So thank you again for giving up your time so generously. And thank you, Bruce, for allowing it to happen. So. Um, also, we have even song this evening. It is one of the jewels of the Anglican tradition to come and hear this beautiful choral music by our scola here at St. John's tonight at 5. So if you can... Invite a friend and come. You will not be sorry that you did. Speaking of music, this is kind of a bittersweet time that we are going to say goodbye to one of our co-chair of our choristers. So I would like Catherine to come forward, please. To come stand right beside you. This is Catherine Faust. She has served as one of our co-head choristers this year. And uh, because of your musical ability and talent and gifts, she is going to be more involved with the production at school, meaning that she can't continue the rest of this year. But we bid you well. We wish you blessings. And with the expectation, you'll be back next year, right? <laughs> so thank you so much. Please give her a hand for hard work. Young adults give so much of their time and their talent, and it's something that we are the benefits of many, many times over. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, whatever you are wrestling with, whatever the challenge is, know that you're welcome to come forward to receive the body and blood of Christ, the bread and the wine that we take to uphold and sustain us as we go about the challenges in our daily life. So walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Also, I forgot to mention, we have healing ministers at the font. So if you would like to say a prayer or ask a blessing for you or for someone else, please come forward during communion. Also, directly next to the font are candles that you may light, uh, again, for yourself or someone else. We are doing that during the Lenten season as another way to lift up our prayers to God.
give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy, and renewed by your word and sacraments, that they may come to the fulfillment of grace, which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And that the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Keep this your family, Lord, with your never-failing mercy that relying solely on the help of your heavenly grace, they may be upheld by your divine protection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
of Christ. 